Good morning and good afternoon to all of our viewers, and thank you for joining us. My name is Elizabeth Murray, and I am a senior program officer in the Africa Center at the United States Institute of Peace. <clears throat> Alongside the National Endowment for Democracy, our co-sponsor for this event, we at USIP are delighted to host today's conversation to highlight civil society's perspectives on peace and democracy in the Central African Republic. I first want to share an important logistical note. You will notice that there are two webcasts on the page that you are viewing. The top one is in English and the bottom one is in French. You may choose the one that you wish to view. I'd also like to share just a few words about USIP. We are a national, nonpartisan, independent institute founded by the United States Congress in 1984. We are dedicated to reducing and mitigating violent conflict through our work with local partners and governments to build capacity to manage conflict peacefully. USIP has worked in Sub-Saharan Africa since the late 1980s. In recognition of the peacebuilding opportunities in the region and the importance of Africa to U.S. national security, USIP created the Africa Center in late 2020. The Central African Republic has been a priority for USIP since we began work in the country in 2014. We have had the privilege of working with many exceptional partners in civil society, at the community level, in government, and with multilateral organizations. We hope that today's event will draw attention to the continuing conflict in CAR and generate ideas and proposals for how to support Central Africans who are working for peace. While some of the indicators in CAR are favorable, including improved security in the West and many major towns in the East, insecurity remains a fact of life for many Central Africans. Armed groups and the Central African Armed Forces and their allies have all been accused of human rights violations. Around 25% of the population remains displaced and approximately half of the population is food insecure. In many regions of the country, citizens do not have access to basic services. CAR is also at the center of a rivalry between external partners. This rivalry has had significant consequences for international assistance to the country, and the CAR government stands at the precipice of a financial crisis. Amidst these challenges, however, community leaders and civil society leaders have shown creativity and persistence in working to reduce tension and violence. Local mediation and other peace-building efforts have succeeded in bringing a degree of stability to many parts of the country, even as formal peace agreements have struggled to take hold. We have an excellent group of panelists today, and we will introduce them shortly. They include three Central African civil society leaders and one international analyst. During the first portion of the event, our experts will respond to a series of questions about the challenges to peace and democracy in CAR. We invite you, our audience, to submit questions via the chat box at the bottom of the webcast page. You may submit your questions in French or English. We also invite you to tweet about the event using the hashtag CAR Peace and Democracy. Peace and democracy in CAR are important first and foremost for the 4.9 million Central Africans. But CAR is also important to the region. With several coups in Francophone Africa over the past two years, it is vital to examine and work to mitigate the risks to democracy in CAR. Moreover, the conflict dynamics in the Central Africa region cross borders and span to neighboring countries. Achieving a durable peace in CAR will bring spillover benefits to the country's neighbors. I'd now like to hand the floor to my colleague, my colleague Valerie Najibe, Program Officer for Central Africa at the National Endowment for Democracy, who will moderate the conversation. Valerie, we at USIT are grateful for our partnership with the National Endowment for Democracy on Central Africa, and we are pleased to be co-hosting this event with you. La parole est à vous. Merci, Elisabeth. Bonjour, ou bon après-midi. 
Chapter Thank you, Elizabeth, and a good afternoon to viewers from Bangui, D.C., and all of the cities in the world who follow us. My name is uh, Valérie Najibé. I'm head of the uh, Central African Program at the National Endowment for Democracy. We uh, are uh, the uh, Congrès américain. NED, and we uh, were created in 1983 by the U.S. Congress as a nonprofit organization dedicated to growth and peace building in the world. This foundation, this endowment, is uh, at the forefront of democracy. We at NDI are convinced that uh, democracy is something that is a right for one and all. And NDI offers over 2,000 subsidies to support projects in over 100 countries working for democracy since its independence from France in 1960. Central African Republic has been subject to sectarian violence in a chronic fashion, and this has slowed our democracy or democratic progress. We have a lot of great natural resources, gold, diamonds, uranium, gas, wood, and fauna. NDI has been in uh, the CAR for over 27 years of, to support civil society, peace, social cohesion, education, and civic engagement uh, with a particular focus on youth, women, and other traditionally marginalized groups in the society. The, we are also very happy to co-sponsor this event, as my uh, colleague uh, Elizabeth mentioned, is uh, very timely given the situation in Central African Republic. And in order to begin the subject, these perspectives on peace and security in CAR, uh, these perspectives from the civil society, we have four excellent experts and panelists. Ms. Kesi Martin Ekomo Soigné, who is a young activist from Central Africa. She's also the founder and director of the Uhu organization. We also have Mr. Rosin Ngatong Zalang, who is president of the uh, youth organization Association Jeunesse en Marche for Development in CAR. We also have Mr. Abdel Nour, the vice president for Islamic youth in CAR. And from Nairobi, Kenya, we also have Mr. Hans de Marie Ngou. He is a, a senior Central African analyst uh, within International Crisis Group. So we will begin our discussion, and we're going to start with our first uh, question for Casey. Casey, there are reports that uh, indicate that security in CAR has improved, including in the West and uh, major cities in the East. Is this true, that citizens are now benefiting from a better security? Thank you, uh, Valérie. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you for this uh, meeting. And to answer this question, I think we have to look at the Central African security issue. There are different approaches. The first is that we need to see security under the angle of uh, the armed groups. And we also have to see what is the democracy dynamics in the country. How then does CAR consider security? We did a number of polls uh, on site. 
And security is considered as a freedom of movement in Central African affairs. And today, when we compare it to two years ago, it's true that things have improved. But as I mentioned, it doesn't mean that things have radically changed. Today, we notice that, uh, for instance, we're not talking about tensions or attacks. It's more isolated incidents in a province. So we don't have these massive killings of the population. But that said, we still see a lot of tensions among different groups and PACAs who uh, have the Russian allies on their side. And so there are sporadic incidents. Fortunately, we have fewer of these uh, other incidents. Relative to what's going on, however, we notice that in this progression, in the different activities that are led by the security forces, we do have a number of aggressive behaviors against the Peul community. And that is basically a growing and latent conflict with regards to the uh, situation. Second uh, dynamic is the democracy dynamic. And we have the, the PACA and the, the allies that the government has decided to uh, deal with. It's difficult with the civil society as a whole, and there is an impact uh, on security. We notice today uh, that the civil society is quite worried about this. Thank you, Casey. My second question is related to this. Uh, there have been a number of coups in Francophone Africa over the last two years. Uh, how strong is uh, Central African democracy right now? Are there major risks? And we will ask our panelists, Hans and Abdel, perhaps they can give us some uh, response. Hans, would you like to take it away? Yes, hello again, or good morning, good afternoon, or wherever you may be located. I have a point of view that might be slightly different from the dominant uh, response. I think uh, the CAR has a long way to go before it can really ensure its democracy. And I would compare this to uh, other uh, countries in Central Africa where the democracy or democratic system is uh, more advanced. There are several criteria to uh, uh, determine the level of democracy. You can look at the institutions, the documents, uh, as well as the check and balance, uh, separation of powers, and the existence of uh, an opposition that has a certain power, civil society, and we could include the media who also are uh, playing a counterpoint in democracy. So those are the large uh, principles. And under that light, we could say that, yes, the Central African Republic has a democratic process, but it's not as good as it could be, especially with the different measures that were taken by the executive power over the last two years. Uh, the the uh, oppose, opposing parties were uh, seeing their passports, uh, detained, and the civil society is not really able to mobilize and to demonstrate in the streets. And with regards to this and the kind of precarity that we see in Central Africa, uh, we could think that Central African democracy is problematic. The uh, executive controls the parliament and the judicial, and we saw this. 
in various uh, situations. But with regards to the tax, last year I looked at the constitutional uh, tax of the CIMAC area. And I, I concluded that uh, this is something that we will look at in terms of how these texts were developed. And the Central African Republic and its own constitution, I think, is much further advanced than many other countries in the subregion. The same applies to our electoral law, and we have to also consider in the implementation. There's a lot to say there. When I discussed uh, with a few opponents and, uh, say, uh, the head of the, the opposition, they acknowledged fundamentally that there's nothing much to uh, challenge, but they... Uh, but uh, some of the institutions, on the other hand, uh, the Constitutional Court in the old days was somewhat objective over the 18 months. So gradually, they slipped into uh, the favoring uh, the executive power, rather. I'll conclude with a, uh, another point, which is the following. Uh, the CAR is a social uh, construct uh, from an anthropological point of view. There, again, I only have uh, a mostly positive view of uh, the this country, when you see how uh, the political parties uh, have uh, come together in Sumac and uh, Cameroon, Gabon, you'll see in most of these uh, spaces, there are strong chieftains. Uh, that's an outgrowth of uh, ethnic communities that wanted uh, uh, vertical power. Even if this verticality, there are checks and balances. Uh, there was the Cameroon phenomenon in uh, Cameroon, but when you see uh, traditional uh, CER uh, uh, constructs in, um, in the Northeast, there are a few sultans, but uh, over time, rarely uh, a chieftain benefited from this form of uh, uh, omnipotence that you see in other uh, uh, societies such as Chad and Gabon, even this uh, leads one to think that uh, in the CAR, there is a form, in my opinion, of horizontality, which is not uh, rooted uh, uh, enough. Uh, I'll conclude by the, 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 our country, CAR, has still a uh, ways to go in terms of democrat democratization. If you consider the great principles of democracy, uh, balance of power, elections, and so forth. However, but it, it is the country which is the smallest uh, GNP of Sumac, but from an institutional point of view, and the way uh, we have written these things down, we are the furthest advanced. Uh, thank you, Hans. Uh, and discussing these elections, we know that the uh, last elections, uh, the last local uh, CR were organized in 1988, and since then, uh, the organization of local versus, uh, is a uh, party. Uh, the, you suggested uh, local elections for the first time in, in a while uh, this year. This will be after the last elections. Um, Rosine, uh, now, could you tell us more in terms of uh, the, the status of uh, elections? Will they really take place? And what are the preparations uh, and what are the requirements uh, that should be in place? Could you anal analyze this uh, situation, please? We cannot hear you. Rosine, it seems that your microphone is muted. Uh... Hello? Hello, Rosine. Hello, everyone. For this moment, uh, this exchange is very important. 
as you know, it is important to underscore this uh, theme. Currently, the political arc is at a standstill. Uh, Rosin, can you speak louder? Because we really can't hear you terribly well at all. As I was saying, thank you. It's important to underscore that the tragic disappearance of, uh, of a certain form of politics in the CR. That's why we're uh, witnessing what is going on right now. Allow me to pay tribute, first of all, to the political goodwill. <laughs> to uh, come up with the organization of elections. And they should take place uh, on September 11th. But that was uh, postponed. Otherwise, it's a major challenge for peace. Why? Because the current generation, the pe people who are old enough to vote, have not uh, experienced elections uh, on a municipal level. So it's important for this generation. It's important to say that the success of these elections will be a victory for democracy. However, uh, the failure of these elections can uh, trigger something worse, uh, further deterioration of democracy and peace and CAR. Speaking of this, the, the pr in terms of the preparations, there is a national authority for elections that, that oversees this, but you have to review the, the, the mapping and you have to update, um, and that's a lot of work too, to, to be successful in terms of the organization. It, it's, and uh, these local elections are very uh, healthy for peace and democracy. So in a nutshell, I'll come back to this uh, challenge for democracy and peace. If the government and the Central Africans are successful on a local level, it will prepare the people to, to, to vote, to, ex to explain why, what are the advantages, and this will motivate uh, participation in CAR. Thank you, Rosa. A very pertinent uh, analysis. I would like to uh, remind the audience and encourage uh, viewers uh, to submit their questions uh, in uh, the, the chat box at the bottom of the page. We encourage them as well to uh, use uh, the hashtag of the event, CAR, Peace and Democracy. If you could uh, do that, I think that Musine and UNED will be very proud. My next question uh, pertains to KC. Since you work with the, the youth and the women in terms of uh, education uh, engagement, do you think that uh, the citizens will participate in these local elections? And what are your ideas to improve uh, this uh, citizen involvement? Thank you, Valérie.
I will piggyback on what Hussein said. I think that we are in a country for over 30 years. There was no local governance. Uh, even I am of a generation. I don't know what uh, local governance is all about. Uh, it's very theoretical, although we learned it in school. We are part of a youth movement, and for us, it's um, we are full of hope to pursue this. And uh, the gap between the people and uh, the deciders, the decision makers, is so huge. It's good to have this opportunity. These local elections, as Rosine said are historical, but beyond everything, uh, you have to support the communities as well. And that's what we're trying to do through our organizations to explain what is local governance, uh, to understand the importance, but identify one's role and to avoid uh, the, the same um, a scheme. Uh, we want to create a framework where the people can speak up and play this role and have an, an impact uh, in terms of governance at, at, at a national level. When I got in touch with different uh, young people, when we talk about local governance, a lot of people are in disbelief. Uh, they feel it, it, it's just going to be a rubber stamp of what exists already, but people see it uh, as an opportunity, but the support is, is, is really fundamental. It's not only a question of funding, but it's also common sense and organization as an organization from civil society. And I think we have to re-inject trust. Uh, it was interesting what uh, Os was saying in terms of local authorities in the CAR context. That's one of the issues we experienced. We, we lost uh, the value and the importance to have local leaders who, who uh, support uh, the local communities. And that's where I f we find a meaning in our fight as a citizen. I, I, I'm full of hope as a young person. And I see that uh, amongst my peers, uh, the women are uh, committed, uh, they understand that they can play a role. There's the law on uh, parity that is about to be implemented, but at a local level, there's an opportunity to, they, and the women understood this, things are moving, the campaigns are working well, more and more uh, young people and young women, and it's extremely positive. Um, thank you. Uh, to see you, you mentioned uh, Hans, I'd like to go back to that. And, and to um, the, ask the same question to Abdel, who is the vice president of Jika. What is his analysis uh, of uh, the robustness of uh, CAR democracy? Are there major risks uh, involved? We cannot hear you, Abdel. Uh, is, uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valéry. I think uh, in terms of my predecessor, I will reiterate certain elements uh, that pertain to uh, democracy and uh, CAR. We are experiencing a situation that we've lived through uh, over 10 years as um, was uh, underscored in the question, uh, the Central African authorities uh, have uh, piggybacked on this phenomenon, which uh, is uh, becoming a reality in uh, French-speaking uh, African countries. As Hans mentioned, CAR has, a, has enjoyed a certain momentum in terms of feasibility of uh, these uh, laws uh, to, to respect uh, freedom of expression, human rights. As you can see, this happens a, a, a country where we have a democracy, and uh, very often the opposition is seen as enemies. We feel that we are enemies. 
un certificat lambda ne pourrait jamais aller sur sur des une radio nationale. A general African could never go on to a national radio and speak out. La démocratie en tant que telle, comme on voit dans démocratie, as we see it in Western countries, is predicated upon the public. The national authorities are looking to the public to get messages, but that's not the situation here in the way that we are structured. And in terms of powers and institutions, um, those are already in place. The issues with regards to communication, good governance, uh, there are institutions and there is uh, compliance of, to those principles of democracy. But I think for other issues, we are really in our very first steps. As far as our democratic solidity, I think we're really in our uh, initial steps. We mentioned the solution which is underway in uh, CAR, which has to do the electoral issues. And uh, I did want to... Uh, follow up on what Kessy had mentioned. There are a number of rumors on social networks which has to do with the modification of the processes, and this is, seems to be growing. Uh, a number of parties, including one that is a Fonds pour la Constitution, that uh, mobilize a number of young people in various villages or neighborhoods, and the idea would be to uh, modify the uh, Constitution. I think the young people are aware, the people is, are also alerted by the situation as well as the authorities. So I think if we wanted to really consolidate our democracy, we have to respect the Constitution. The Constitution is absolutely fundamental. It is the one guarantee of normal democracy. And if there's a violation of the Constitution, we no longer have a democracy. So, yes, Central African Republic is progressing in terms of respecting the democratic principles, but not entirely. And in certain areas, it's not applying the principles. So that is what I wanted to add to the conversation. Yes, uh, I think we'll follow up on a question, uh, which I will uh, Ask Rosen, is hate speech a serious problem in CAR? What is the impact that it is having on the uh, conflict in terms of democratic process? And who is most at risk? And how is it possible to fight against this kind of hate speech? Thank you. I would like to say that yes, hate speech is a problem in our country. With given, given the fact that we have a tremendous ethnic diversity, many ethnic groups, different languages, and hate speech is a problem. We have noticed an increase in hate speech amongst different groups and as a way to push people to action. And I think this has the result of fueling latent conflicts. We have looked at the situation with regards to hate speech. We've noticed that sometimes people who are controlling a certain region will be the ones using this hate speech to challenge 
the right or the authorities of others. Sometimes certain terms are used from uh, certain languages, which are pejorative. It is a way of creating division amongst people, of creating mistrust amongst each other, so that a control could be established on a certain region. The ones who are with power, in power, uh, use this hate speech, and those um, between the government and the people, these uh, issues are, are uh, growing. So I think what we need to do the, the interpreter apologizes, but the sound is extremely choppy and difficult to hear. What we need to do is teach young people also to speak to others and to recognize diversity as a wealth, as a richness in the country. I think if we have proper speech and we know how to speak to each other, we can grow within the community. We have to teach political leaders to speak that way as well, to speak in terms of peace and democracy. Otherwise, we will not uh, move forward. Thank you, Rosalina Adela. Yes, uh, diversity is a wealth, and these kinds of uh, peaceful speech are good, are very positive. So, uh, thank you for answering that. Uh, Abdallah, uh, do you think it's a problem, this hate speech? Uh, I, I think absolutely. I would not even hesitate. The cultural diversity that we have in Central Africa is uh, very precious. We have a multitude of uh, ethnic communities, as we've mentioned, and I think that is a tremendous wealth. These are the necessary elements and the important elements for us to consolidate uh, our wealth in Central African Republic. But most of the population as a whole, does not have the way of measuring the impact and the width of uh, certain words. They are not aware of the fact that certain words have an impact on behavior or on the moral state. And as a result, they cannot really recognize the extent to which uh, this uh, has an impact. I think that certain actors have uh, noticed that, that their terms are words that are used in discussions, uh, and those are words that will trigger conflict. They will trigger conflicts within the community or ethnic uh, groups. So there is a kind of glossary of hate speech that uh, is are used in the Central African Republic. And so I would say, if you have uh, Muslim Central Africans and you'll say, oh, you're an Arab, you're a Bururu. Well, the Arab would say that, we're, we'll say, you know, we are part of the Arab community instead of Central African community. But uh, when we talk about Arabs, uh, we think about Saudi Arabia. So when we call somebody an Arab, you're basically saying you're not a Central African, uh, you are somebody else. And there are a number of uh, bandits. We also uh, use words like chien, people who uh, 
wear face covering. We call them dogs of Chadira. And that's very shocking. There are words that have a tremendous impact. And that, I think, is the fundamental issue that uh, characterizes uh, this hateful speech in Central Africa. And you mentioned one thing, and you said, it does it have an impact? Of course it has an impact. If we are here today, I think it's because uh, certain uh, elements wanted to see this shakeup in CAR. Uh, there's uh, defamation, discredit, uh, accusations that are preferred, and these words are important. We say, oh, the northerner is here, or oh, you have to stay there, oh, the southerner is here. And these are discriminatory distinctions. It's what really promotes hate against one and all. So I would say that, yes, we still have hate speech in CAR, and it has an impact. Uh, and sometimes in the neighborhood, we'll say, oh, go see the Yakoma lady. That is a Central African ethnic group. And go to the Yakoma uh, woman to buy, uh, you know, spice. And so we're basically teaching the kids that there are different members of society. And these children will grow up with this idea and this uh, way of seeing, way of living. And as a result, it anchors uh, something in their mind and it changes their outlook. So with regards to hate speech, I think we have a huge amount of work to do. First of all, we have to increase various activities to fight against hate speech within the community, and we have to have programs to fight against this because it's very difficult uh, on a financial level to uh, have any kind of mobility otherwise. So I don't know if you have something to add to that, but I would say that, yes, hate speech is a very serious problem in Central African Republic. Thank you very much for that contribution. No. We're going to talk now about the political agreement for peace and reconciliation in the CAR, which was signed in February 2019 with 14 armed groups. This agreement was uh, limited. It was uh, put in peace and uh, other efforts were started for the Great Lakes regions to launch these processes. So what is the situation with the peace process in uh, CAR, and what is the best way to go forward to reach an agreement that will be respected? Thank you. This is a hugely important subject. Why? Because when this agreement was signed in the previous weeks, if you remember, the agreement was presented as a last recourse, the last chance agreement. And when we talked to the various diplomats of Western and African uh, Union countries, that was a perception that they still have to this day, that there is a kind of weariness uh, on uh, the part of uh, these uh, parties. Uh, there's so much has been mobilized in time and energy and resources to find a political solution uh, that would allow the uh, Central African government and armed groups to cohabitate. But even within the text itself of the agreement, there are some issues. Uh, for instance, uh, talking about transitional justice or the implementation of certain aspects and, and certain uh, elements were left uh, very undefined. It became just a very generalized uh, uh, advocacy. Uh, but I think unless things are very specified in details, um, you know, this is not uh, tenable and we cannot move forward from the Khartoum agreements. But I think the most important part was the implementation of this agreement because it was not done in good faith, not on the part of the government, not on the part of the armed groups. And 
I would say that on the part of the government, there's also a responsibility, the fact that uh, certain units, such as the MSQ, were not put in place. And there were a number of processes that uh, were pointing out certain armed groups, whether they had uh, taken over power or just had uh, decisional power. I think the examples are legion. There is a procedure now in front of the uh, criminal courts because the 3R was responsible for uh, massacres in the MUNA area. So a number of violations of the armed groups. So the agreement is at a standstill, if uh, to be you know, perfectly honest. And I think it has very little chance to uh, be revived at this point, um, if we can use that word, for a number of reasons. The two actors brought about uh, positions that are irreconcilable. Uh, now you have the Wagner paramilitary people who are in a uh, position of strength. Uh, they were able to expel uh, uh, expel people from uh, the above uh, mentioned uh, locations, and they're relegated to the periphery of, and the periphery of the periphery. So the government. Uh, does not intend to negotiate a new agreement or even grant uh, these uh, armed groups what they seek. Uh, uh, it, it was discussed uh, in Khartoum with uh, the former head of state, Boussizé. Uh, um, Amongst uh, other requests, uh, they, uh, they wanted they want to be able to control the territory that they control heretofore. They have to have to go to Bambari. The, they have to go back to Bosangoa and so forth. And the government, for the government, uh, it's out of the question for the armed groups. Uh, if we weren't able uh, to take power, we should at least be able to get back our former uh, situation, which was already uh, fraught. And it's because of uh, uh, the situations uh, they launch uh, the operation. Uh, uh, and the, you also mentioned uh, the following. It, uh, the, there's uh, discouragement. Uh, there's a lack of goodwill from the government uh, that made some uh, robust statements. But in practice, as I said, it, it, there's no longer an interest to negotiate with the armed groups. And, uh, and they promise those who would surrender uh, would not uh, uh, fall between uh, uh, the, the net of, uh, of justice. But uh, the armed groups uh, are... They do not want to abandon uh, fighting. They're hoping that the international situation will uh, play in their favor and that here and there certain actors, uh, non-Central Africans, will uh, help them out in their operations. And this is very risky as well because these actors, when you observe them, and they seem uh, ex in, uh, uh, disinclined to such uh, maneuvers. So we might uh, end up with a status quo for, and uh, the, the group arms uh, will still have uh, thousands of men uh, in different uh, uh, local uh, areas along the borders, uh, and there'll be skirmishes, and uh, the, we also have the government uh, 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 supported by the, the Russians, and you find them in the main cities, making sure that most of uh, the economy, the most important uh, uh, mining sites, and the main uh, uh, corridors uh, between uh, uh, leading to Bongi will be under their control. Thank you, Hans. KC, there's not much of a likelihood to have an, uh, an, a peace accord. Uh, so do you see uh, a, a roadmap uh, to reach uh, a long-lasting peace agreement? that will be respected. Uh, thank you, Valerie. I think that I will...
I will explain rather how uh, civil society perceives uh, the situation very candidly. M no, nobody speaks of uh, PPR. People don't believe in it anymore. We don't believe in it. We're we're not aware of uh, uh, the evolution, despite the secretariat uh, at the president's uh, level. In terms of the initiative with uh, the Great Lakes, the, the situation uh, today is not what it should be. But it's not a lack of interest, but I think uh, we need a, the civil society to refocus. Things have uh, evolved uh, to discuss the security issues. Uh, the civil society realized that uh, security had somewhat improved, but at the central level, at the government level, at the, in terms of the state, there are dynamics that are destroying actually the, the trust and the stability of the, the people. There are excesses, uh, there are attempts uh, to change the constitution. Uh, there are false inf information uh, circulating. Some actors uh, are going on social networks. Uh, these are very harsh. Uh, uh, <laughs> rhetoric for civil society. So, and we know that regardless, uh, the accords are what they are, and, and that what, what they're doing there, it's a way of protecting these accords uh, to uh, hold people to the accords uh, that they have uh, taken. Uh, it poses some problems. The uh, agreements are being followed, uh, but there's people are discouraged. Uh, the partners continue to quote them, uh, but uh, without be really believing. And I think that every at the end of the day, everybody is concerned uh, by how the state is evolving, the choices that are being made on different issues uh, that lead us to think that for a lot of people, we might uh, end up in another crisis uh, in the years to come because nothing is stable anymore. You see, let's uh, remain with uh, civil society. Abdel, what are the main challenges to which uh, civil society is uh, confronted. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, thank you, Valerie. I think that uh, there are huge challenges uh, that uh, civil society must meet in terms of peace, namely, and democracy. And from a peace perspective, as Kissy had underscored earlier, there's a slight improvement in terms of security, but not much. Insecurity remains. That's a challenge uh, to promote uh, peace. Um, the uh, uh, civil society, civil society is not only promoting peace, but it, it encourages uh, the people to be resilient. If um, if we if there's no free uh, movement in terms of uh, activities on the ground, it, things are not easy. As a result, uh, this issue of insecurity remains a phenomenon that we must fight to promote peace in uh, Central Africa. Uh, a second element which uh, represents a challenge linked to peace. It's this issue linked to the hate speech uh, on the social networks. Things go viral. People, if somebody see a conflict uh, with such such a person, this me there are messages that concern not only the person who who's uh, the addressee, but the uh, other people linked to the regime or a, a certain ethnic group or, or a certain uh, religion. So as a result, uh, this hate speech, uh, uh, these hateful words represent a huge challenge to promote peace. Uh, third element, the civil society is active on the ground. They are more focused 
and uh, actually Bangui and, uh, and inside the country. These are international organizations that are inside the country, uh, supported by certain national organizations, but few. But uh, civil society can't really enlarge its scope. It's, it's a question of financial mobility. So that's a hurdle. There's goodwill. There are skills. You have strategies, methods to reach out are there. But sometimes there's this lack of ability that uh, uh, civil society experiences in terms of democracy and, and uh, CAR, we have to try to underscore this democracy, I think. CAR is, is moving ahead in terms of uh, stability and... Um, to get to know democracy better. The, uh, uh, linked to this, uh, the, the people psychologically lives in fear to express entirely what uh, they feel linked either to the government or a phenomenon. People are afraid, in, in a nutshell, too. There's this issue related to impunity and intolerance. And yes, uh, civil society is fighting, but sometimes uh, the voice is not heard. Uh, th th there was this issue related to the ministry of hurting in the, the Constitution, Article 28, uh, pre uh, preventing people to, to, to get access to a government position. But actually, that's, there's no state per se in, in the, the government. People came in via the window rather than the, the main door. So these, uh, this is also related to democracy and inclusion, in conclusion, freedom of expression. The people feel that it must feel that he's in his country, that he can express himself as he pleases. This should be underscored that people live in fear; they can't express their feelings, feelings uh, publicly or privately. So society is undermined. Uh, the you, you feel that uh, your neighbor is your friend, but. Uh, and uh, and you become uh, suspicious. So fear is in the heart of many uh, Central Africans. They feel they don't have this freedom. They cannot express their feelings, their joy. That are some of the challenges since Kessie is there and Rosinella, if there are certain elements uh, uh, linked to peace and democracy, as experts, they can uh, bring about uh, more uh, moving ahead in this direction. There are a few questions from uh, the public, uh, the, the audience. The first question is linked to this hate uh, rhetoric. Uh, we're, you're being asked, is there a difference in these hateful uh, rhetorics? Uh, but, uh, is there a difference between what happens in Bangui, the capital, and uh, the, um, the, the country? Yes, there is a difference. CAR enjoys uh, ethnic diversity, and, and there are a whole array of uh, local languages as well. They are not compatible, which uh, the, the national language, let me take an example in Central Africa and people come from, uh, uh, they say Asugada, people come from the forest. That word, that very word creates a tension. Some who comes from the inside will, uh, he, he will not be accepted as somebody from from the bush or, or, the, or the forest. This is a, a typical example. Uh, moreover, there's also certain elements uh, inside. There are. Uh, let me take uh, the case of uh, ethnic groups. 
the Apoa people. There is the Kaba ethnic group, and there's, there are two uh, Apoa ethnic groups that don't get along. There were a number of activities that were uh, in groups that were living together and they had to come together, these uh, two different ethnic groups. But that is just an example. If you are a member of one ethnic group, you might not necessarily agree or get along with the different uh, ethnic groups. And we did not see necessarily confrontation, but uh, we have terms, for instance, like <laughs> that translates uh, traditionally to people who like to eat, how could I say this? How could I describe it? So it's the, the French translation that uh, is a problematic. Yes, it's this idea Now we're, we're following what you're saying, but there's another issue related to this because uh, people in general, when they look at their role as civil society, and especially with the, the upcoming elections, you know, they wonder how they can participate, how they can be a part of it. Well, that is the heart of the work that we're trying to do with the civil society. Because what we need is to set in place observers, independent observers that could supervise the elections and beyond this, we would need some kind of supervisory or monitoring instances so that we can prevent any kind of fraud. Uh, like I said, we're really in a context today that has uh, cooling things down. It's hard for people to understand what the fraud is and how they are being manipulated. Today, we see, for instance, uh, petitions going around to change constitutions. I, that is something that really alerted us as civil society. So we know how important it is to give good, the proper information to the population because we already see that there's quite a bit of disinformation around the workings of the government. And and it's important for the civil society to gain good information and to follow the candidates as well as the various leaders that they will ostensibly support and to work with young people because they're highly uh, dynamic electoral campaigns in our country are often part and parcel of uh, disinformation, of uh, gifts uh, to different groups. So there's got to be a lot of work, not only for national elections, but also for local elections. I think that's the way we need to proceed. Yes, and Casey, I'd like to follow up with another question from the audience who's asking, what does civil society expect from MINUSCA to bring peace back to Central African Republic? Well, MINUSCA has a new leadership. This is recent, and this is a new director. And so we are waiting to see what's going to happen in different approaches and different discussions and how we can move forward with them. I think over the last few months or maybe the last years, the discussions were not as productive with the MINUSCA as they had been in prior times. So maybe this new leadership will give us a chance to look at certain realities and uh, include a civil society um, 
the population perhaps MINUSCA can play that role to give proper information, correct information, and serve as a bridge between us and our authorities. And this is a role that they do play. We recognize that. But in the last few years, we noticed that uh, we had lost, to some degree, a strategic partner with them. So we're waiting to see, and uh, we're hopeful. The door is open. Yes, I think I've had you talk about the challenges of uh, civil society in Central African Republic. And I did want to ask a very quick question to Reza and Hans. What are your recommendations with regards to the way in which the international community can contribute Tribute to peace and democracy in Central African Republic. And perhaps you could uh, give us a one minute response. Uh, Hans, thank you. Thank you. My recommendations to increase, improve the situation. EA, can you please speak up because your sound is very low? Yes, as I was saying. We need to improve the public's confidence. Civil society needs to feel more confident and to see a certain amount of competency on the part of the authorities. I think there needs to be a number of peace and democracy initiatives on the part of civil society as well. Thank you, Rosa. Hans, what do the CIR people expect from the international community to uh, support peace and democracy? I cannot really uh, reflect all of the opinions uh, that are currently in Central African Republics to answer such a question, but I would throw it back to a number of our partners. Uh, there are two points that I would bring up for a lot of time, a long time. And it was not uh, very popular, but in order to develop uh, African countries, uh, we had to go around the actual governments. But I'd like to bring attention to this because in Central African Republic and elsewhere, sometimes it's the government that is responsible for the failure of the uh, country. So we need to see what civil society needs to have and what the government needs to function. And our international partners need to ask themselves this question, what is the priority uh, and what should be the priorities for that? And politically, uh, sometimes they're very involved uh, and they can give a lot of means to bring back peace and democracy. So we need to decide where in Central African Republic space the uh, you know, this help will, will come. And this is a characteristic approach. You can't truly push a society to go towards certain models with uh, a certain optics that is just predicated on the stick approach. If the government has uh, what you deem to be negative and you bring out the stick, well, you also need, when there is progress, uh, especially with stability and democracy, then we need to see a substantial aid uh, that would recognize what has been done, uh, what has been contributed to, because uh, we know that uh, sometimes these donors are uh, the American taxpayers or Japanese taxpayers, but I uh, think we need enormous means and our international partners need to be aware of that. So we can't just have a drip by drip kind of help and especially in Central Africa. 
a hand, and I'm also interested to, in hearing what Casey has to say. What are the expectations on the part of the CAR people with regards to the international community for peace and democracy building? So there is an expectation, yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, CAR is uh, at a, an ideological pivot point. Something is happening throughout the country, and we can see it through different positions that are taken by different actors. There is a political change happening, whether positive or negative, it is happening. And what we're expecting uh, the part of the international community is to take stock, stop and take stock. I think we're going too fast and, and there are positions and decisions that are being taken that over the long term could be uh, harmful. So we really need to understand, to see things as they're coming to the fore and I highlight this and every time I will have a platform I will uh, underline this. I think there is currently an an ideological position, and if we don't look at that, if we don't analyze it, if we don't uh, really focus on it and we underestimate it, then we are going to become a country that no one will recognize, and one day we'll wake up and uh, that will be the case. So before offering any kind of solutions, we have to be aware of that and we have to react to that. Thank you so much, Casey. I think we've come to the end of our debate. Uh, Let's uh, congratulate all our panelists, all of our experts, for these relevant analyses on the uh, theme of the day. I'd like to give Elizabeth this, uh, the floor for a few closing remarks. Thank you to one and all. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you to all of our speakers for this very, very rich conversation and for so generously sharing your expertise. It was so useful to hear your analysis um, from the ground in Central African Republic and to hear your specific insights on the challenges to peace and democracy. It seems that in recent months, uh, other armed conflicts in the region and other challenges to democracy have drawn a lot of the international attention away from CAR. I think you have really convinced us of the need to refocus on CAR um, and the need to make sure that any international policies, international assistance are well informed by perspectives from the ground. At the same time, I leave the conversation feeling hopeful. You also reminded us of the many opportunities of partnership with youth, partnerships with women's groups, partnerships with civil society, with community organizations, and the large opportunity that is the local elections, if we all work together to ensure that citizens are, are well poised to, to participate. So thank you, thank you for your work, for sharing your expertise. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today virtually. There was a tremendous amount of, of attention and, and many of you are viewing. I apologize that we could not get to all of the questions, um, but I know um, that I speak on behalf of Valerie as well when I say that the National Endowment for Democracy and the U.S. Institute of Peace would love to host a follow-on conversation. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.